Welcome to your Sunday edition of Wasatch Weekends. I'm your host, Maddie Evans, and we have so many great things taking place on the show. Not only are we going to introduce you to the recruiter guy, Bill Humbert, and give you some great tips and tricks on finding that perfect career or that perfect candidate in your possible future, we're also going to be showing you how to make the perfect ribbon scrambled eggs. And if you didn't know what a ribbon scrambled egg is, well, we're going to teach you because I didn't know, and so this is a great learning experience. We're also going to be talking about some of the risks and avoiding factors of lung cancer, so make sure that you stay tuned. sharing knowledge with you and knowledge that might help you in your life and a great coach is the recruiter guy Bill Humbert and so he's gonna give us some great tips and tricks on it maybe what you need to do to find the perfect candidate or to be the perfect candidate for that new career so let's see what he has to say are you in the market for a new job while well, your biggest stunt factor could be your own resume and we've got recruiter guy Bill Humbert here to talk us through on how you can improve your resume good morning Bill Good morning, Maddie. It's great to see you. It's so great to see you, and it's always so great to have some of your expert knowledge shared with us. So that way, if any of us are in the market for a new job, you're going to give us all the right tips and tricks to find that job that's going to fit with our lifestyle perfectly. That's correct. We'll, we're going to rip into it. You know, what I've found is that many people fret over their resumes during their job search. And as a leading talent attraction consultant with over 40 years of experience, I have read over 400,000 resumes. And over those years, I've read the great, the good, and the truly terrible resumes. Now, it's important that people don't have that truly terrible resume. So what are some of the things that people should make sure are in their resume? From a structure perspective, it's important to put your name and contact information at the top of the resume. Now, over the years, you can imagine, I've had several candidates not put their contact or even their name on the top of the resume, and I'm going, wow, this person has great experience, but I don't know who they are. So make sure your name and contact information right at the top, and I like to see them centered, and then followed by a four to five sentence summary of your experience with some metrics of the accomplishments that you've made. When you write a resume, drop the pronouns and begin sentences with action verbs and put them in the past tense, even your current job. And then write your responsibilities in a paragraph format and then bullet point your accomplishments. And again, it's best to have metrics because that demonstrates the impact. And then it finally put in your college education if you ha have a college education. If not, if you have ex uh, different certifications, put them at the end. Now, what are many of the mistakes that most people make as they're writing their resumes? Most people do not understand that they need to end up having one base resume and then having building another resume off of that functional first resume, that base resume, and tailor it to the wording in the job description. Otherwise, what will happen is the applicant tracking system will just throw you out. So put the, use the same words that the job description has to describe what it is that you're doing. 
And if you do that, um, you're speaking their language. And speaking your language will keep your resume from getting screened out by the applicant tracking system. Which is really important, and especially now as We've got different technologies that can go through, read your resume, get through it very quickly. Those buzzwords that you do see the job or the employer using are really important for you to focus on. Exactly. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, applicant tracking system companies say they use artificial intelligence to select the candidates, but truly it's just a keyword search, so I call it artificial, artificial intelligence which is just one step that you have to make it through to be able to get that job. Now you've got a great book out, it's called Expect Success. This book talks about why it's important to list your accomplishments. Now why is it important that you give people your list of accomplishments as you're applying for a job? So accomplishments define you as a candidate. And unless you list your accomplishments, preferably with, with the metrics that demonstrate the impact, your, your accomplishments probably will not be included in the interview because the manager typically goes right down through your resume while they're interviewing you. And they're going to bring those accomplishments up, they're going to expand on them, they're going to talk about them a little bit, but if you're uncomfortable to bring those up in the interview, it's best that they're on your resume. Absolutely. You know, and it's, you know, you see some people that, well, I don't want to brag. Well, now's the time to brag. <laughs> you know, brag now because that's how you're going to get the job. And all of these tips and tricks will help people find that perfect career for them because there are so many different tools to use out there. Now, if someone wants you to maybe help them build a resume, is that a service that you offer? I offer coaching, and so the job search mirrors, and I know people are going to love to hear this, the job search mirrors the sales process perfectly. And, um, you know, if you pick up Expect Success, the science of the over 50 career search, it doesn't matter your age, it's good for everybody. I just hit a niche. So pick that book up and it'll give you a lot of tips. But if you want actual coaching, just go to recruiterguide.com and above the fold, there's a red banner that says, speak with Bill, pick a time that fits your calendar and uh, we'll have a conversation and, you know, you can decide whether you want my coaching or not. And if you had one final conclusion that you would like to bring to people's attention as we wrap up this interview, what is that piece? You know, accomplishments listed on your resume demonstrate your strength as a candidate. And that's what attracts people. Well, I was going to let that be the final question, but as people are going through and deciding what their accomplishments are and what they would like to list, how do they narrow it down to pick the best few for their resume? I'll just go to the job description and see what the job description says that, that they require. Um, that's one way. The second way, if you've networked your way in, talk to the person who introduced you to the manager and say, you know, what do you think that manager's major issues are that I may be able to help? And boy, that, that way you can just dial right in to exactly what they need. Bill, you always have the best advice for people who are either searching for the perfect candidate or people who are the perfect candidate searching for the perfect job. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and giving us all this great information. Thank you, Maddie. It was great chatting with you. Make sure that you go to recruiterguy.com. That way you can get some time with Bill. You can pick his brain and you can get even more of his knowledge because he is a fantastic coach. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we've got more of the show. Kim had the chance to talk to an expert on lung cancer and an aggressive form of lung cancer and what we need to know and to be prepared for if we see it in our lives. So let's hear what they have to say. Now we are in the summer months and there may be a rise in the use of vaping products and a decline in the use of tobacco, but lung cancer is a very important discussion to be had and I don't think we have enough of it. Joining me today is Dr. Paul Verdon, the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Amgen to talk more about this disease and how we can be better prepared and aware of it. Dr. Burton, how are you this morning? 
Good morning, Kimberly. Thank you for having me on well. Well, thank you so much for joining. So let's talk a bit about lung cancer. You know, why is small lung cell can small cell lung cancer so important and uh, dramatic and effective and devastating? Yeah, no, it, look, look, it really is, uh, Kimberly. So of all of lung cancer, small cell lung cancer represents about 15%, so one in seven patients. That means that here in the United States, about 35,000 people every year will be diagnosed with small cell lung cancer. It's very important because it's a very aggressive and very hard to treat type of, type of cancer and certainly type of lung cancer. It grows very fast, it spreads, and typically it presents late in patients. So they get to their doctor when they have extensive stage disease. And that means that for you know, the five year survival for small cell lung cancer with extensive stage disease is only about 3%. And when you think about that in terms of, of months of life, it means that on average, patients will only live for maybe three to five months after they've been diagnosed with this extensive stage small cell lung cancer. So it's an important condition, important type of cancer, very aggressive, and it makes it hard to treat. Now, are you able to catch it early enough or it doesn't show symptoms until late stages? Yeah, you, so the symptoms often are shortness of breath, cough, cough that doesn't go away. You know, these are often kind of symptoms that many other diseases have as well. And so patients may overlook them. By the time they get to their physician, as I say, it's very fast growing, it's spread. And so it presents very late in, in many of the cases. Well, can you talk to us about the outlook for patients if they are diagnosed with this disease? Yeah, so there are treatment options. People with early stage disease can have surgery. There's radiotherapy and chemotherapy, and radiotherapy and chemotherapy are often quite effective early on. But what cancer cells do is they find ways to escape therapy. They find ways to get around radiotherapy, ways to get around chemotherapy, and that's what happens with small cell, and that's why the outlook you know, it's really bleak, three to five month survival on average for these patients, uh, even with therapy, if they have extensive stage disease. Mm. Wow, it's, uh, it sounds very, very intense and definitely something to be aware of. So how can we better treat our health to be preventative from this disease? Yeah, well, certainly having screening, as you said at the start, you know, thinking about lifestyles, go to your doctor, be aware of signs and symptoms that you may that you may develop and you know don't overlook them in 2023 amgen presented data from a clinical trial of a medicine called imdeltra now imdeltra is an antibody that essentially has two arms to it one arm grabs onto the lung cancer cells and the other arm grabs onto a white blood cell in the patient's body and it pulls that white blood cell into the cancer. And as it does that, it activates the patient's immune system and it stimulates a very strong immune response against the cancer so that essentially the patient's own immune system kills the cancer cells. Now, I mentioned that the survival on average that we see in these late stage, extensive stage patients is maybe three to five months. When we presented these study findings, we were thrilled to find that actually we almost tripled the survival in these patients out to 14 months on average. Wow. That's another Thanksgiving, you know, it's another opportunity to see a grandchild's graduation. So we think this is a potentially transformative new therapy, new treatment option for these patients and we were thrilled with the results. Well, thank you to Amgen for being on the forefront of finding this new treatment option. Now, let's talk a bit about preventative lifestyle habits. You know, what are some things, are, they, are there certain habits that really kind of cause a rise in lung cancer or is it just, you know, by genetics and just what happens? Certainly their genetics are involved um, and you can be screened for that. You know, when pa patients are diagnosed with lung cancer, Often they'll have a little biopsy of the cancer, can be screened for that. Some people who are exposed to different uh, environmental things like asbestos mm -hmm. uh, can develop lung cancer. We certainly know smoking is associated with it. So you know, these are risk factors that if you have those and you then get the symptoms, don't, you know, don't overlook them. It, it's extremely important. Um, just last week, the FDA granted accelerated approval for Imdeltra. 
Now they want additional studies to be done and we're committed to that, we're committed to doing the studies, committed to the patients. But so now there is at least this you know, potentially transformative new treatment option for those patients with extensive stage disease. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Burton, where can we go for more information? Like any medicine, uh, Imdeltra does have some severe side effects, and it's important that patients and their physicians know about those. There is a website, imdeltra.com, I-M-D-E-L-L-T-R-A.com. Patients can go there. They can learn more about small cell lung cancer. They can certainly learn more about Imdeltra. And then they can have that discussion with their physician, their oncologist, and see what is a, a good new treatment option for them and, uh, and have that discussion. So, imdeltra.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you to you and thank you to Amgen for being on the forefront of innovation and uh, helping prevent and treat the, this incredible and aggressive disease. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Burton. Thank you, Kimberly. Absolutely. Now, stay tuned. We'll be back with more after this quick commercial break. I had the chance to chat with an incredible chef on how to make the perfect ribbon scrambled eggs. And I didn't know how to do it or even what it looked like. And so we're going to introduce you to this technique. Welcome back to the show. We're joined by Chef Hannigan, who's going to teach us on how we maybe have been making eggs wrong this whole time. Chef Hannigan, can you give us an introduction to who you are and what you do, please? Yeah, good morning. Um... I'm the culinary director of, of Two Hands Restaurants, um, and we are going to be making our seasonal scrambled egg today, um, which is a spring variation of our, our menu item. Which a lot of people don't know that they could be making scrambled eggs wrong, and there's a step that we're missing in doing so. Can you give us some more information on that step? Yes, yeah, there is, there's a few key aspects when, you know, any menu item at Two Hands, particularly our seasonal scrambled eggs, um, really high quality ingredients, pasture raised eggs in, in this reference, um, a really good quality non-stick pan, and a lot of patience. Now you've perfected the technique of making a soft ribbon scrambled eggs. I don't know what a soft ribbon scrambled egg is, so can you give us some more information on that? Yeah, absolutely. So soft ribbon scrambled eggs is quintessentially an Australian style of, of cooking scrambled eggs. Um, within the Two Hands restaurants, these dishes, you know, we change them out seasonally. They come together very quickly. Um, so, you know, it's vital to have all of your components ready before you start cooking your egg. Uh, we have a macadamia nut pesto. Um, you know, which is, a, which is accompanied by our spring salad, which is fresh peas, snap peas, uh, spring leaves. Um, and another really important part of the process is having your scrambled egg mix ready to go. Um, and we do that by blending our eggs with a stick blender and heavy cream. Um, and followed by, you know, passing that through a, a fine mess strainer. And that just really, you know, the, the straining really breaks up the cell structure of the egg, um, which will enable you to get that really nice soft ribbon uh, technique happening. Um, so, you know, get your pan onto a medium high heat, um, adding in your extra virgin olive oil to that, um, seasoning with sea salt. Uh, and this is where your, your patience really, you know, needs to come into play. Um, moving that egg around the pan slightly, you know, you're allowing it to cook evenly. Um, using a rubber spatula, we kind of want to watch for the egg to cook around the edges and then bring that in. Um, and then it comes together quickly, pull your pan back and forth, to create a bit of a bow tie, and then just roll it into a nice little tight ribbon egg nest per se. Wow, I've just learned and so much. Now it. I can try this at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to give it a go. But remember the patience. The patience is key. Now, not all eggs are the same. So what are your preferences as you're choosing the eggs to use? Yeah, so definitely pasture raised eggs is the way to go. Um, at Two Hands, we, you know, we're really looking for purveyors that have an ethos that really aligns with us. Um, you know, we've teamed up with Vital Farms for our, for our egg supply and they just really ensure like the hen's welfare, 
Um, they use family farms. The, the sustainable agriculture is a, is a huge component of, of their program as well, um, which just really aligns with, with two hands and what we try and do. Now, as people are shopping for eggs, you've mentioned some things to look for, but there's cage-free, there's pasture-raised. What's the difference and why is it so important for people to look for those little details as they're egg shopping? Yeah, absolutely. So it can get a bit confusing and it's, it's intimidating when trying to find the right egg. Um, so really you want to look for that pasture raise um, description on, on the carton. Um, and that just really ensures that the, the hens have access to outside, lots of, lots of sunlight, you know, space to roam around and scratch and, and lay their eggs. It's, it's really important. Um, yeah, and cage-free kind of, they, they don't have as much freedom as pasture raised. So it's a it's a really good you know definition to kind of gauge there which i think is so important because you want the animals to be happy because then the eggs are happy and then you can seriously taste the difference my mom has chickens and her eggs are the best eggs i've ever eaten i bet absolutely yeah yeah now if people are interested in learning this recipe that you have shared with us where can they go to get that yeah so you can get this recipe off the vital farms website um, it's going to be on their Vital Kitchen blog, and this dish is in all the Two Hands restaurants throughout spring and summer, um, so stop by and, and try it out. Chef Hannigan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and giving us all this great information and inspiring me to maybe try to cook something new at home. Absolutely. Expiring. Expiring you. Yeah, there. I love a good pun. Thank you for that, too. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> Make sure, Thanks so much. Yes, of course. Make sure that you check out this recipe online. This is something that you can easily make at home and maybe elevate the dishes that you're making for your family. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we've got more of the show, so stay tuned. Thank you so much for tuning into your Sunday edition of Wasatch Weekends. We love getting to be here and bring you all of this great information. Now, I hope I've inspired you to try a new technique of scrambled eggs at home because I'm definitely going to go try it first thing this morning. Make sure that you tune in tomorrow for your Monday edition of Wasatch Weekends. I've been your host, Maddie Evans, and I'll see you then.